in class really need to know this. So students who are in class, take this five minutes to ignore, <laughs> ignore me, <laughs> turn your microphone down and just write your own ideas that you want to present. Um, I apologize. I can't keep all the buttons going at the right. Now, do you all have access to the screen share? No, nope. here you go. So you can scroll down on this document and write your reactions. You can even go past where I went and start to look at the universal patterns and you can write. So just keep writing and writing uh, while I'm talking. Okay, so for the people who missed class and they're listening to this as a, as a YouTube video, um, the reason I assign you to read about slaves in the US is because the basic foundation of my view of the humanities classes is that we do have a common humanity. And the modern world said we're a blank slate and we don't. And that science and social science are literally gonna socially engineer people so they don't have to read about the past. We're not gonna be like that anymore. That's primitive, right? And we're enlightened. And that ruined the humanities because that was really what humanities disciplines were trying to teach people is the mistakes of history. They could be, we could make these mistakes again. You should learn from history so you don't make those mistakes, but you, can, you, you will be able to understand them because they come up all the time. Every generation has to relearn these basic patterns these basic instinctual drives, better and worse ways to deal with them. So that's why I assigned this, which is even though these people appear to be different, there's underlying patterns that I hope you can identify with. That's why I picked these two and I picked the particular pages and I have these outlines. So the first part of the outline is just physically the story of her life. So you all have the story of your life, where you were born, where you moved to, why you moved there, who your parents were, you know, all this stuff that doesn't necessarily tell us anything about your spiritual life, your intellectual life, your emotional life, you know, how you're processing these situations that you're in and everybody's different. Um, so the first point, her mother taught her to believe in God and this belief in God has driven her life. So you all think about, was there some idea of the good, whether it might be completely humanist without any God, it might be karma, it might be anything. But was there any sort of guiding light for you? Did your parents encourage some specific thing that had a name on it or whatever? Um, she was sold and um, then she finally got a, a master that she liked. And so this follows John Stuart Mill's view of sexism, said that originally women don't complain about sexism, they complain about specific men who beat them, you know, and your husband doesn't beat you. And it was the same with slavery. She didn't question the institution and her master was pretty nice. So she wanted to have babies for her master so that he would have more money, right? He would get richer. And looking back, she says, I cannot believe I was that brainwashed into it. And so the idea is that you, social conditioning is powerful. You can brainwash people for a while, but ultimately the truth comes out because Sojourner Truth, Frederick Douglass, they figure out they're not unequal. They're not stupid. They're as smart as any white person. And so they, they get it. We, you know, we have a natural understanding of this stuff. Um, then she, there was always problems with her family because her kids got sold away from her and she was always trying to get them back as soon as she had 
some sort of resources. And um, her son didn't even want to come at first because he didn't know who she was. And he'd been beaten and threatened and he was so afraid. But her relation to her son was problematic because he, once he got to be free, he became kind of a rebellious kid because he was mad <laughs> right, at the world, understandably. Uh, but anyway, that's part of her story is trying to be a decent mom in a situation that made it impossible. Um, she had a religious epiphany, just like um, Jesus, Buddha, Muhammad, Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita, uh, Gandhi. A lot of people have these just epiphanies where they just change their minds radically. Um, she joined a sect. So she, God, you know, her idea of God was always with her. And so when she met up with these preachers who really thought they knew everything about God, and she got sucked into it. She followed false prophets. She ended up losing all her money, um, but that happens. And so you can all, all of you can think about examples in your life, maybe not you or your family, but people you know, or stories about people in your society. Um, okay, so. That's, there was the story of her physical life. She ended up as an activist. She was against slavery and also against uh, patriarchy. She, she fought for women's rights and to abolish slavery. So she started out accepting slavery, embracing slavery, and she ended up completely rejecting it. So she changed. Um, and then the story of her spiritual odyssey is she had this idea of God, her mother planted this seed, and then she'd make deals with God when she was little. Okay, God, I'll be a good little girl if you'll give me this. And then um, she got sold into a much better house. I think she got even put in a house where she wasn't a slave. And then she stopped praying. <laughs> I don't need God anymore. Uh, <laughs> I think that's kind of typical. Um, and then she did have that religious experience, which there's many stories of people having those kinds of experiences. And then her view of God became less personal and more spiritual. So um, the excerpt that I gave you has that she wanted to find out what the Bible said about God because she couldn't read. So she asked some adults to read it to her, but then she understood they were interpreting it. She didn't want other people interpreting it. So she asked children to read it to her so she could just think for herself. And so she's starting to learn to think for herself and not get sucked in to other people's views. And then in the book of Genesis, where it says he created everything and then he rested. And she said, wait a second, God's a spirit. God doesn't get tired. This is crazy. And so, so you know, what she decided is the Bible has the spirit of God in it. But the people who are trying to understand it get corrupted and they have their own interpretations and they get blinded. And they're, you know, those interpretations aren't necessarily true, just like the people reading the Bible to her. So she started becoming very uh, independent minded. Uh, she became consciousness of her conscious of herself as evil. And the woman in the New York Times article had that kind of a consciousness. Um, then she it took her a while to figure out that white people hated her. And then she prayed to God again. Hey, God, could you help me? <laughs> could you control them? Um, and then when she tried to paste her, her family back together, it was hard because she hadn't been able to be a mom. She ended up going to church with her sister without even knowing it. And then she starts, you know, it just becomes clear and clear how awful the institution of slavery is how unnatural, how wrong. You can't just say, well, moral relativism, as long as people accept it, it's okay. 
So Ruth Benedict, you know, you just wonder how on earth could that woman really believe that? Um, let's see. Anyway, um, all right. And then the excerpts that I gave you are closer to the end here, I think, that she has her own interpretation of Genesis. Um, so a lot of the stuff I gave you is about her learning how to think for herself. So again, you can, I, I hope you can identify with all of that. So now I'll go through the second half of this outline because I wrote my own ideas about the patterns. Someone planted a seed. Life is worth more than it appears to be, right? There's, we, have, we naturally seek a higher purpose in life. Often that gets associated with the word God, but it certainly doesn't have to. It can be social justice. It can be environmental protection. These days, it can, there's lots of meaningful causes. Um, children tend to think of God as a person. Children tend to make deals with God. Um, they tend to accept the way of life they grew up with. Um, and then some people have a, a mystical experience, but in general, uh, in college or sometime in your 20s. So often this happens in your late 20s. So you just keep going until that this happened to my children. It happened to me about 26, 27. They were off doing a whole lot of different things. And then it just sort of came together. You know, I said, okay, mom, this is what I want to do. And then they went to grad school. I didn't do that. I went, I had kids right away and I went straight to grad school, but it was about that age where I figured out why I liked Plato because I didn't, I didn't accept any of the people who were teaching me. I decided they were all wrong. And then I finally figured out and that was a long haul, but that's not your problem. Um, so my advice, you know, just keep going. Sometimes you won't necessarily know where it's going, but at a certain point, there'll be some revelation or some coming together. This is really what I want to do. And, and you have to keep trying, though, before you, before you actually know. You have to have knocked on doors that don't open or go through detours. But that's all right, as long as you keep trying. Um, okay, so Carl Jung, archetypal psychology. These are patterns in people's lives. There's one that happens when people are young and they break away. They have to figure out who they are and what they want. And then at midlife, where people have answered a lot of questions about family and job, and then they ask, well, besides you know, me doing everything I need to do, what, who am I really? And how can I go over and above that for something meaningful, right? A deeper sense of purpose. Um, okay, in general, people's ideas of the good get less personal. In general, they get less tied to any one doctrine. Um, and then they become aware of socialization and the power to lead you toward or away from a meaningful life. They become aware of hypocrisy, false prophets. They become aware of the way people deceive themselves about how holy they are or whatever. Um, Let's see, they realize that, okay, they, these are all kind of related, fixating on words and actually living a certain kind of life. They want purity of heart, clarity of thought, and expansion of application. So you want to do what's good, you keep trying to clarify what that is, and then you keep expanding on that, right? So, and adapting to situations. Um, Let's see, and all of this is pretty much ecumenical, right? So your social activism is based on faith or on your ideas of the good and the bad. And you can recognize the relationship between secular humanism and all of the different religious traditions. So you can sort of see how they come together 
Uh, it's bigger than any one tradition. Okay, so now I want every student to write, respond, say something, and everybody else take notes for your post, right? Okay, Ashlyn, you're going to say something so wonderful that everybody else is going to get 50 words out of it, and it'll be great. And they'll say, hey, thanks, Ashlyn. <laughs> okay, go for it. Help out your sisters here so they can get the cheat sheet. All right. So hello, Professor, and good morning, everybody. Um, I'll just start by asking a question that came to my mind. And uh, so as we were discussing in the outline, Professor itself told that, like, uh, her mother made her very religious, like believe in God and everything. So I just wanted to know, uh, did the religion in particular, it, it took a it took a time for her to shift her mindset that slavery is bad, right? So did the religion in the initial step made her think that this authority or this slavery is fine to be followed? Or uh, when did she had this shift that this authority is not good? And when was the first time that she thought that it, it, it is something that we should raise our voice against. So when, when I had this question in my mind, I just went through some online sources. I'm, I'm not sure whether it is true. So uh, I what I read from the online sources is that she uh, there was this time when God himself, like she also found God as a person himself revealed to her and God wanted her to kind of, uh, you know, um, uh, like raise her voice against what is happening but I didn't get a clarity on what instant and on what particular instant she started her voice against this authoritative slavery so I just wanted to get clarified at the end of my discussion about that um, again uh, what I found very interesting is her proofs of her energy and independency of character so as we have discussed um, she Mm, was she she could actually realize that she was falsely interpreted or falsely manipulated by the preachers like the false preaching that was done to her since childhood so once when she understood that everything what she learned was manipulated and once she started reasoning herself again the idea of other religious uh, other philosophies that we had in the previous classes she started reasoning herself that whatever she taught was from like uh, people or a group of persons point of view and from not her own so again this this actually uh, drives me to another um, I'm not sure whether it is correct another point that she has started teaching or started talking to other people from her own point of view that she got from the religious uh, I mean uh, from the religious text and all so um, I'm not sure I'm just thinking it critically is it again calling her subjective point of view to other a group of people like when she when she teaches whatever she got from the religious her individual perspective on the religious text is it again something coming as a subjective idea of her own perspective to a group of people it, i'm just thinking it from a critical point of view and Okay, so uh, another thing is a disapproval of the second advent. So as a Christian or as a born Christian, I know that the second advent is one of the important preachings or principles that we have in Christianity, that uh, uh, Jesus, will, Jesus Christ would come for this judgment, like the second advent. But when people, like even if she convinced the group of people that she is believing in God, and when these people asked her, are you believing in second advent? So... I feel it very interesting the answer she gave it's like uh, since I didn't get any detail regarding the second advent or I didn't hear from God myself I can agree into the second advent so the reasoning I have in my mind doesn't support anything related to the second advent so again that um, uh, emphasizes or embraces her idea of reasoning and the manipulative or the false preaching she had before so again um uh, you know, to okay to connect these points to John Stuart Mill idea of not hating an authority, uh, but hating just some principle that doesn't make sense. I am personally was also taught by my parents or the religious um, leaders that 
unless and until a religious a religious doctrine is harming anyone you are good to follow it i was also following the same i was indirectly manipulated that for example the inequalities that a women is getting i was indirectly manipulated or influenced it is not harming anyone and it might be the thing what jesus christ or god uh, himself needs that women should be like this like this but once when i started reasoning or once when i got a platform like aow to think that to start reasoning on my own i found that okay i was indirectly manipulated or i was getting the false interpretation or false preaching till that period that i i should act like this i should act like that so once when we start reasoning or once when we start thinking from our own mind not influenced by any external forces i guess things gets better and this fear of sin and uh, yeah at the feeling of sin and fear should be uh, should uh, sh will not necessarily lead us into a healthy psyche and another thing so that is my shift from accepting blindly whatever i was taught from the beginning and Uh, starting my own reasoning um another thing okay make that i just wanted to talk about making deals with god so that was actually as as professor told that is again a typical thing that everyone does uh when i was also like this uh, when i was also a uh, child when i was taking exams or anything that i wanted to achieve in my life i'll be like okay jesus please um I, I, <laughs> <laughs> if you give me good, yeah if you give me good grades i'll be a nice girl i won't be doing anything um wrong what you don't like so it's like what our religion taught us like we'll be giving offerings right if you are getting good grades for exams okay i'll i'll light these many candles at, in the church so that's kind of deal that we made with god <laughs> okay so, okay, so that's, yeah, that's great yeah, that's um, one of the thing i wanted to add yeah right. so the whole idea of manipulation and uh, false pre uh, false preaching is uh, is one of the points i wanted to highlight I very good i, I just actually that. i think i think just that one question where you said was there some one point right mm -hmm. did you want to know that that was yeah, there yeah, some yeah. point okay i mean really if you read the book it's very interesting because she'd get there and then she'd fall back right because she didn't have confidence right and so those false prophets would come okay i think that and then she'd break you know she really waffled a lot you know it wasn't like that wasn't just a straight shot right so that's i think that's your answer is that okay was that what you were wondering yeah, yes professor yeah okay. it's actually i just wanted to uh, know the initial like the point of shift of her ideology that everything what she was taught or blindly believed is false but she was not knowing it but what what made her accept that everything that she taught or she she thought or she was blindly believing is wrong so yeah it waffles you know yeah yeah okay very good let's give ashlyn and oh i wish i wish you guys could turn on your videos we would have this class would be so much better right if everybody could just see their face but okay so aurora what you got okay does everybody want to put a hand clap up there for <laughs> let's just do something so that i know you're listening one clap masoma okay new chat okay all right oh very good i see some hands very good okay so aurora your turn Yes, Professor. Okay, so children's uh, article is, of course, uh, her express about the concept of God and religious, and her life is moral and spiritual influences for others. Here, God and life are compared as a person and stage for children that they can understand easily spiritual things. And uh, uh, I also, know from the first person of this article that uh, americans especially despite of uh, breaking on democracy americans decide their rights based on the skin color 
And one thing uh, what Ashlyn said that the dear sweet God, I also did this in my childhood and even in present I also do sometimes. But uh, from one of my close person, I knew that uh, deal with God is not good. Like uh, <laughs> God gives us when we pray, when we pray for, uh, when we pray, yeah, when we pray and when we did, uh, when we do good works, good things. Mm, so then God will give us everything. If we don't do any good things and just say it and just deal with God, please, if you did to me, then I will do it. So it's not that kind of thing. If we do good works, we listen to our parents and we pray, then God will give us good things, our willful things. Yeah, that's it. Okay. And so Aristotle is saying you should raise a kid to want to do it just because it's the noble thing to do, right? No ulterior motive. So does that make sense? Aristotle is a, is a pagan humanist, basically, but he thinks character strength means that you do it just because it's the right thing to do, no matter what. Does that make sense to you, Aurora? Yes, Professor. Okay, good. Very good. All right. So. Um, I don't, I'm not sure who's next, but I'll do Falak. Falak, are you there? Okay. Oh dear. Uh, Christina, are you there? Yes, Professor. Okay, go ahead. Professor, my parents teach me to follow God and they raised me religiously. And I also agree with uh, Ashlyn that the God's deal I also do, did, uh, do this. And uh, I think I always, uh, when I, I was in pain, I always blame to God that uh, why, why he gives me pain. I don't think uh, that why, uh, why I feel pain. I don't think uh, I I don't think the reason. I just blame him. He gives me pain like this. Okay, so do you understand then why I had that whole list of types of suffering? Right. So when you have pain, instead of blaming God, you go, well, what is the source of this pain? Right. Was it something I did, or was it genetic? Do you understand that, Christina? that when you're suffering pain you instead of just blaming god you you go through the list what are the causes right yes does that make sense to you christina now yes, yes. yeah that's the idea that that's the way that you change from belief to reason as yes, the, yes. yeah okay good um, and then I hope oh, sure. yeah 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 I hear that uh, God gives pain whom he loves most yeah well, <laughs> yeah yeah well there's that right but I I think in general Aurora uh you know all the things that the AUW students have experienced right lots of obstacles right yeah. and so if you want to think of it as God gave you this so that you would have strength of character, fine. But you could just say, I don't think it's God's fault, right? It's just, yeah. this is science. But, but if you understand the causes, then you, you could have strength of character, right? And yeah. it depends. I mean, I just don't like it when women think of God as this all-powerful male that will put obstacles in their way, right? To strengthen their character. But I mean, if you want to think about that it that way, that's fine. It's just that it's very easy then to run into males, you know, the physical ones, and be more accepting of mistreatment. Does that make sense, Aurora? Yeah, professor. Where if you just say it's just the human condition, we were this is just, you know, God created heaven and earth and then we evolved and we're vulnerable and all this stuff and it's God isn't really out to get you or something. 
Um, it's just that life is basically requires a lot of strength of character just to live a good life. So it's really up to you because I don't like to tell you, but at least it should make sense to you that I, I don't want <laughs> that. It, it's just hard for me to, you know, to watch yeah. young women think there's some guy in the yeah, sky. Maybe. <laughs> I think God concept is vary from person to person. Different person thinks about different things about God. That's right. And and actually, Sojourner Truth changed. So that's another thing. It went from more personal to less personal. So, um, all right. So let's see. Uh, Masoma, I, I skipped you. Somehow you're, you got shifted on the screen. But anyway, go ahead, Masoma. Uh, yeah, thank you, Professor. Uh, so, Professor, yes, I'm agree, like, with uh, Ashleen, like, she mentioned that, you know, uh, what she found is interesting and motivating, actually, for me, that how this shift happened in Sojourner lives. I mean, this is amazing, Professor. You know, it's not an easy task when you are brought up in a society that not only society, but even your own parents that have, a, like, a very big in, uh, influence on you, accept slavery and accept this all wrong things, right? But then you are brought up in this and then you are not giving any tools. You are not educated to, you know, think and reason. But then well, our case is like kind of different because, you know, we are brought up, like we have this platform or AWO, we, uh, we do think. And then, uh, I mean, it's, it's like, I really found it motivating. Like it's not, you can find your way uh, even, uh, I mean, uh, it also reminded me that, you know, how obstacles and life make us strong. So I heard it somewhere and then, uh, you know, it's not like, you know, to make you more physically strong to bear those uh, obstacles and issues. It's like, you know, they make you think, they make you that, you know, uh, ask question like whether it's right or wrong, right? So this is what with uh, Sujana also uh, like happened, like he, you know, he going uh, with his, uh, you know, biological sister without even knowing it. And then uh, like all those uh, issues that she faced. And also I, I think, uh, yeah, the false prophets and all. So I think this is what make her to think about this condition. And, and yeah, it's like, you know, we should be, uh, thankful about the obstacles that we are facing because this this make us strong this make us you know to think um this is one point that i wanted meant uh, i mean to mention and then uh yeah um okay um oh yeah here. And then, go ahead uh, Professor, about, you know, the, the religious belief and then the deal with the God. I think this is a similar case in my society as well. And this has happened with me as well when I was charged there. This is true. And then, uh, Professor, I think, you know, the, the, this is important that we should have our, our own in interdependence or interpretation and reasoning. So, yeah, there is a lot of things wrong going. I know that this is wrong. I don't accept those things in my religion as well. So, yeah, I'm like, you know, this is misunderstood. This is misinterpreted by society. I'm not going to accept this. And then this makes me happy because before I was, you know, suffering professor, before I was like, uh, I was lost. Like, is it like really true? Which kind of religion is this? That is sexism or this is, this have like this strong ideas. But then I found that, okay, it's like, you know, more a kind of misinterpretation by people as well. And some of them might, you know, be a false uh, um, claim that people made or even related it with their religious. So yeah, we should use our reasoning. And then it gave me peace that I found my way, you know, to interpret God, how God will look. Is it like humanitarian or is it like, you know, creating this inequality and sexism? So it make me like, you know, it, yeah, like I'm happy now that I have my, my way. And then I found it very like interesting and related. And then I was thinking that like, you know, Sojourner case was, you know, very difficult. I mean, he, he was not educated. He was not, you know, uh, provided with the tools to think about uh, or reason. But then, yeah, this is- It's actually a woman. It's actually a woman. Her name was Isabella. So that's even more amazing, right? Yeah, yeah, Professor. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I mean, really, Sojourner sounds probably more like a man. So, um, 
Yeah, the professor, I understand. Like she, uh, like uh, um, she was a woman. She had a son, and then you know she was giving birth to all the children. Yeah. But then it's like you know, kind of grammar mistakes. I, I only sometimes miss he or she. And then, That's okay. Yeah. It's just kind of important because it's a woman. How independent she was. It's pretty amazing. But here's yes, another yeah. thing, Masoma. I was gonna say. So I've taught, you know since for 25 years, I taught in this very conservative area. So I grew up, nobody ever separated reason from faith. There was never a problem with science or evolution or anything. Uh, it was just like breathing. But I went there and all of a sudden, everybody assumes they're split. And um, so my, I felt like my mission at that school was to present students every lecture another possible way to unite reason and faith. Um, but I think at AUW, students come having, they had to critically think about their religion because for most of them, their religion told them women shouldn't go to colleges or good colleges, right? So they're already sort of thinking critically. But the thing I noticed at AUW, I think, and you can tell me, is that the people there, I think, for the most part, would call themselves humanists. And there are any classes where students get a chance to bring in their religious background and their religious consciousness and sort of think it through, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Is that fair? Is that fair that... I mean, you just separate that. Okay, that's that life. And then this is this life. And I don't know if you get that much chance to figure out well, where's the intersection. Professor, like, you know, um, recently in the recent world, religious reason is not that important because it is very different. And we have, you know, most of us have different religious beliefs. So it's like, you know, don't, you know, uh, interfere with the religious beliefs don't like you know go into that but then use your reason uh because we we are not following your religion so we cannot be right well i just do think you you can find these common virtues of aristotle and common experiences between jesus and buddha and confucius and Mohammed. so there really is a lot of common ground there so um Anyway, my classes just give you a chance to work that out. That's all. So, um, Professor, I just wanted to add something to that. What you have told, uh, it's like I had taken a course, uh, Introduction to Philosophy. Uh, it's it's actually focused on all these philosophies from a ground, like from a grassroots level, like just the philosophical principle. And uh, the course mainly focused if you are in a situation where, like, there will. Uh, the, we will be given a scenario and we will be asked to uh, give a solution or do act something according to the philosophies that we have already okay, good. studied, okay. studied good. in the class. But I didn't find it so deep going into the reasoning stuff that we are doing in the class right now. We are not connecting the reason um, into those philosophies. Rather, we are just, you know, applying those principles blindly. Right. To a situation it's more intellectual. Yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. It's not literature, but that's, I mean, I, I love that teacher. What is her last name again? What was oh. your teacher's name? Uh, that was Dr. Jason Homer who took oh, philosophy. Yeah, to I know. Yeah. yeah, right. He's my friend actually, his office was, oh yeah, we used to have tea and chocolate every afternoon. It was great. But anyway, uh, <laughs> okay. Um, Pooja, I guess it's your turn. Are Hello, you? Professor. Yeah, I am here. Good. So, uh, so uh, the the idea of believing in God and the religious uh, belief was kind of similar to all of the discussion that we had uh, just a while ago. So, uh, the idea of like God and guiding the path is also by my parents, like my mom especially, as she has a deep belief in God and she is like, like a lot of, she believes in a lot of religious matters and the worshiping thing especially. So, uh, 
for example uh, she says that like if you are going somewhere far we need to go to temple and pray in uh, pray god so that we reach safely and she also believes that praying in god whenever we are sad or something very bad is happening in anyone's life uh, makes us feel peaceful and calm and uh, she thinks that there is a power which makes us believe in god whereas there are, there are people like uh, i would say like the people um, i don't know what, how to title them i mean the modern kind of people who who thinks who they, they think that god has just a craving designs of stones and we just do worship when we need them and we share our pain and it makes us i mean like i don't know like not it doesn't make sense to me especially that they think that there is no god and might not be they might be because they are molded by some modern social engineering or things like that also what i would like to point out is that yesterday my mom uh, was telling that like i i don't know i find like in the hindu religion system there are a lot of god, gods yeah. and in my especially in temples in my own home temple there are a lot of god like there are female gods and male gods like that right and when it comes to realization that women are like dominating women i mean i find like that yesterday my mom was like uh, the girls girls should marry soon because if they get to a level where they started uh, uh, realizing the things of right and wrong they started uh, i mean like they will start uh, claiming for their rights and everything and i was so angry at my mom yesterday i was like they so i mean like my mom was like for example like in nepal there are all religions right for example yesterday my mom was saying like muslims i don't know if it sounds good or bad like my mom was like muslim girls get married soon because their family thinks that if uh, they started getting education or started using phones or tvs they will start getting knowledge of a lot of things and uh, which is why their family don't want to make them think like that so and it didn't make me sense and i i i literally we had a conversation yesterday night and we sounded at each other mom you shouldn't think like that you <laughs> daughter is here studying and how could you even say like that i was like literally so pissed off with my mom and literally this kind of thoughts make me feel that i mean like so down sometimes at the same time emotional but i try to keep i keep trying to convince my mom is that yeah okay actually puja that's good to know and i'll tell you that's why I want you to write your paper of what you think a healthy psyche is, right? It's really the only thing you can control is yourself. And um, at least in your mind, you can, you can answer your mother, even if you can't actually talk to her. Right? <laughs> I mean, because people get defensive or whatever, but you can answer her in your head. You can work it out in your head. Um, I know that I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm terribly introverted, but it, that was for me the only relief. I could at least get it straight in my head. I can't control other people, what they do, what they think, but I can at least get what I think are the good reasons, right? At, at least I can straighten it out to myself. That's, that's the last thing I can do. Um, Oh dear, people are raising their hands, but I, could you just hold on to that for a minute? Because we have four more people and then I want to take a break. And then after that, we'll do the questions or comments. I mean, it's great. I'm glad everybody's talking. Um, and you figure out, you know, the slave lady from the U.S., 100 150 years ago that you can identify with her right that's what i want to get you we have this humanity but let's just go right now with asia and i'll just finish these four and then we'll take a break and then we can come back and you can but i mean you're supposed to be writing right getting your posts getting that 
350 plus words down and okay, Asa, go ahead. Asha, because she always has good things to say. But I, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Barely. So just talk louder. Oh my God! Yeah, I don't know what happened to my microphone these days. It's not working. Okay. Uh, so what I was supposed to say? Um, well, during my childhood. Uh, when my mom was just trying to um, teach me what our religion Islam is, then I was uh, asking, I can remember asking her that, uh, how does he look like? Does he look like me? <laughs> does he look like you <laughs> or whatever? Because I was um, trying to connect it with our species, homo sapiens. And then uh, when the day is gone by, and then I understood this is something that um, my mom already said that he exists everywhere within us, outside of us, uh, some kind of spiritual things. Yeah. So this is one thing. And another thing, uh, Professor, can you hear me? Hello. Uh, kind of. Just make sure to speak slower because it's a little bit blurred. Oh, oh okay. okay. So another thing I want to say that I remember an incident and uh, she went some, somewhere in my uh, one of my relatives' home and I forgot to remind her to buy one stuff and then I don't know what happened to me. I didn't call her as well and why didn't I call her? I can remember and I was, I started praying that uh, if she brings that stuff, please if she brings that stuff, God, please. And then my father saw my situation and he said that you should not be praying like this. Then if you pray like this, the faith on God will be lost because you may not get it, right? So it was a funny experience, just like Ashlyn told before. For the exams, we already uh, did it several times. I mean, all the times, actually, even now. And then, but for that one, it was a silly stuff. And I was doing the praying for my mom to bring back this stuff, something like this. So yeah, it was a funny experience. <laughs> okay, good. That's great. Um, Nuj, Nuj Hot. Hi, Professor. <laughs> so I wanted to discuss about the fact that sex is, how sexism and racism is fed to people and it gets so deeply rooted in our mind. So the Bangladeshi um, mates that I have here, I guess you all can, um, uh, you all have heard about an incident recently of Puri Moni, the celebrity, uh, who is clay, um, saying that she got raped and she was uh, tried to be uh, murdered at a a club and uh, by a very um, influential businessman but everyone was um, refusing and everyone was mocking at her and saying that no and uh, when it ca uh, uh, it can't happen and you were just whatever you were saying is a wrong um, um, claim so and and that thing is the the um, reactions that people had even women um, uh, the founder and a very um, uh, and a member of that club was taken an interview about what she thinks about this incident and whatever she told really like blew my mind uh, she was saying that how can a woman go outside of the house after uh, after evening or after 8 p.m. Uh, a woman if she is going out of the home or if she is still not at home when it's 8 p.m. that means obviously she has a problem with her character why was she at the club at 12 um, uh, night so this is how she was um, saying things and also the uh, people uh, the reporters were not even asking her or people who were it was so normal it was the questioning uh, uh, in such a way to a woman's character is so normal so it really was disturbing me and it's it's so dangerous that we women also do not understand actually these that these are the things uh, which um, are fed to us and may, made us forcefully believed and at one point we actually start believing and blame other women dominate other women and also i had one 
question about um i in one of my posts i mentioned that i believe um children at uh, when they are at such a sensitive age uh, parents should not impose a religion on them but um if, from a human perspective if we think suppose i am a parent and i have a child and if i actually believe in a certain religion so deeply and i think that is the ultimate that has the ultimate truth so will it be possible for me as a parent to not impose that on my child because i will think that that is the that is of the ultimate truth and if my child do not go according to that part that means he, he or she may go to hell or hell or have something uh, wrong can happen to him or her so i think uh, yeah we say things like we should not impose um ch- on children a religion but then again if we think from a parent's perspective uh, if uh, that person is extremely religious what will that person do so i i'm um, asking that question to all of you and then about the whole idea of manipulation um <laughs> sometimes i have uh, discussions on religion with my extended family members and i have one aunt <laughs> she always says uh, whenever i'm giving an opinion it can be on religion or any um, a certain aspect of politics or a- about anything of society she always says you are now not old enough to understand this when you will grow old you will understand or when you will grow old you will think like me or also uh, like about facebook um <laughs> i always have this <laughs> that's why i don't want to um, i don't feel like adding my family members on my facebook uh, but <laughs> they always um, judge me based on on the basis of that they are like why did you post this picture why did you post uh, shared that post they are always like this is what you are doing or this is what you are thinking is now wrong and you will understand at one point of your life but whatever you are thinking is not standard so, uh, uh, when i say that this is my opinion and can it can be different from you because we are we belong from different generation then she says that no <laughs> okay and also another thing about religion and she says that um you are now an adult so you are um, if you are uh, now you are a muslim by choice so at that time i become totally surprised and i actually keep thinking in my when i di- when did i say that i am a muslim by choice did you even ask me or did did my family even give me the opportunity to uh, share what i feel or was i actually given an option so yeah these things were running in my mind when i was reading right. that actually you know the whole thing is what do you think a healthy psyche is right is it healthier to just go through all those ideas um yeah that's what you have to think about you know what is flourishing um so fardeen go ahead hello professor um so one of the things that stood out the most to me and this is something that ashlyn and masuma touched on it was the part in the reading where she talked about like asking children to read scripture to her because when she asked adults to do it they would always add in their own interpretation to everything but asking the children meant that they would just repeat the sentences as many times as she wanted and uh, this would give her the opportunity to come up with her own interpretations and develop her own understanding and i just thought that was incredible <laughs> because like she had that courage because a lot of the times i think um when we have people preaching their own beliefs very confidently and in a way that seems superior to us we don't give ourselves enough credit and we think that we are better off listening to them rather than making up our own minds and this doesn't even have to be religious it can be on any other um aspect of knowledge but yeah i think we have a tendency to do that sometimes um but she knew that the idea of god was important to her so she dared to figure out it figure it out on her own like she wasn't satisfied with just accepting um what the other people told her because what if that wasn't good enough she wanted to explore what that meant to her uh, her own meaning and yeah i thought that was very cool good okay now what you got yes me to as the cf and the set it is nice to figure out by ourselves because as for us we mostly like i have said before 
uh, like we didn't figure out the gods by ourselves. We just follow our parents, and then our our parents are as for me as a Christian. They say yes, Jesus is the good, the savior. He is the savior for us. So, oh, we say it. Oh, yes, Jesus will be our savior. So we should follow him. We don't know how to read the Bible by ourselves, and we don't know how to figure it out by ourselves. So, like the way that uh, she figure out by letting the children read and then by listening their audio and figure out the. Uh, how how true the God was, and uh, it is a good one or a good result for us, like finding out who is the real God and and how what good they they are doing and how can we believe that? Yes. Okay, and so the other thing with Aristotle, the reason I bring that in is that to me those are the virtues, and Jesus had them. You know, Buddha had them, um, and so, so that that's why people work out. You know, at least you have a foundation that's not necessarily tied to any sort of doctrine, and then you can work out your idea of the good, right? Um, so anyway, I'm I'm gonna let each I'm gonna take a break now because it's late. It's um, 18 minutes after, according to me. And then I'll take, you know, I'll call on Fala and Aurora and Masoma when we get back. Um, but if you want to also spend this 10 minutes doing your post, you can do that. And I, my goal is to get you feeling by the end of the class, 30 minutes and I'll have it done, right? I, yeah, I don't want people to get behind. So people who are listening to the YouTube, please do the whole thing while you're listening. And then, you know, at the end, 30 minutes for your final wrap up or you're polishing the English, move on. And yeah, it really worries me when students get, try to go at it, you know, in three more hours on a YouTube video and it's just too much. The thought of it just, Oh, <laughs> it's distressing to think about it. Anyway, and you can always come to me during office hours. That's why I didn't worry about it so much before. You know, if it's a problem, I have office hours, but I guess I'm so intimidating, you know, ah, that they were afraid to come because I'm so scary. Uh, okay, so, <laughs> so take some time, guys, okay? So you can ignore... You can ignore us for five minutes if you want. I just think I'll call on these three people and then we'll move on uh, about 30 minutes after the hour. So, okay, Masoma, what, what do you have? Uh, professor, I, I was cut up while, while talking. So yeah, my, my speech was kind of finished, but then I was saying that there is always, you know, we, we we might find found you know some misinterpretation or understanding in our religions which which we are not agree with it and then it's fine and it's okay so you have your reason you have you know we, we can unite our reason and faith I mean this means you know when we are talking about unite our reason and faith it means that you know you you accept your faith by your thinking by your reason that yeah this is true this is okay I, it's acceptable to me right this is the point of you know uniting the reason and faith and then professor i, I want to make a comment about puja's uh, speech that she mentioned about her mother and then uh, the argument that she had so professor i first of all want to say that maybe you know if we see according to her mother point this is true that maybe a lot of Muslim people might do these things and it is true. Maybe her mother saw the examples and people around him having this kind of belief and then they are Muslim. This, I mean, we cannot like, you know, directly blame them because, you know, they, they might have reason for themselves. 
and then there is reason I, I accept that there are a lot of people thinking like this even in my country when we are saying that we are corrupted according to them it means that they don't agree with us right they don't accept that you know for supporting educate reasoning or supporting that a girl should get educated because they think they will be corrupted so this is kind of true and then uh, yeah the ways like you know i i think uh, like it's very hard to convince them if they have this path, faith and for you know very long i mean uh, they if we think about their age like they are 50 or 60 and then bro they brought up with this path and then they accept it still you know i mean it's still they accept this path but then like it's very hard for you to change them only in one day right <laughs> So yeah, yeah, like I'm saying yeah. that if we, according to her mother points, uh, yeah, she's also like right. We cannot blame just directly because it's like hard thing. They are brought up like this, or or they see they have reason for themselves, right? So yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's that's another thing about AUW, right? It pulls students away from their background and their habits and puts them all together, and it you know they just hope that the students will talk to each other and start to find some common ground and start to expand beyond their experiences before they came right because you're intellectually old enough to be able to see the universal patterns and then it's just a matter of being mature enough or you know um it's emotional it's intellectual and it's just your picture of a good life. Is it include religious toleration or not? You know, um, in general, you know, the people who accepted you into AUW and the way it's structured, since you know that there's going to be students from a lot of different religious backgrounds, it seems like it's not fair to the institution, you know, for you to maintain your closed mindedness, but actually at Lyon College, the majority of students are closed minded when they come and they are closed minded when they leave. And they just, I think they're just using the institution, right? Because it's, it has a reputation. They got a break on the cost. And, you know, they made sure not to change their minds about anything. Uh, so it was hard to teach there, right? When the whole premise of the school is to unite reason and faith and half the students refuse to do it. But, you know, <laughs> I'm glad I don't live there anymore. Um, but it's very important if you want a democracy or if you want any kind of accountability to, of your leaders, if you don't unite reason and faith, they will use religion, right, to gain power. It's just guaranteed that they will. Why not, you know? Um, okay, Aurora, what you got? Yeah, Professor, I just want to clear one thing. Like as Puja's mother said about the early marriage in Islam. So I want to just say that there are many reasons behind this. I just put on one reason and that is that uh, when, uh, a per, uh, when uh, people understand the concept of sexuality, then they should marry so that they don't get involved in any illegal relationship. Okay. That's why in the Muslim okay. uh, should believe in early marriage. Yeah. Okay. Falak, what you got? Hello, Professor. Professor, when you called me before I was in the washroom, I'm so sorry. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I want to add that uh, people misinterpret their religion and add their own version to it. For example, uh, I write with my left hand, and then people, when people come see me, they say they say that uh, it's a sin. God doesn't like people who write with the left hand, but it's not my fault that I write with my left hand, and it's also not a sin. <laughs> so I don't think it's uh, true. 
I think they have misinterpreted this. I don't know if it's true or not, but they always say me, don't eat with your left hand or write with your left hand. It's a sin. You will go to he hell. You won't go to heaven. That's it. That's crazy, isn't it? I mean, that's what I don't understand, that you think you know what you don't know, right? There's no way you know that. But I, I guess it's fear. I don't know. I don't know what it is. Um, Ashlyn? One more thing, and then we got to move to um, Frederick Douglass. Yeah, thank you, Professor. I just wanted to ask this out of curiosity to Pooja. So uh, one of the uh, videos that I've, uh, that I've seen in social media, it told in Nepal, there is a tradition that like uh, small children, like particularly girls, they are taken to the temple, giving the entitle of Kumari, which is known as the goddess. So from a very young age, there, there are some platforms like where um, girls are trained and uh, there are some criteria for them to become Kumari, which actually means goddess, um, uh, where they are worshipped without, without their complete knowledge. They are not even knowing that they are being worshipped as a god goddess or something. So I, I find it a bit... Um, problematic because they don't they didn't even develop their reasoning or reasoning capacity to think that what they are doing or what they are doing is is, is influenced by a very religious principle or doctrine that is happening in Nepal so I just wanted to know is it still continuing or there are any protests happening against it because I don't find it very good since um, small oh, children are yeah. religious goddesses yeah, there is a system called Kumari Partha in Nepal. So, uh, so where like the uh, particular, uh, I mean, like caste, for example, New is in Nepal in Kumandu. So they uh, choose a girl who they think according to the priest is a capable, uh, I mean like so-called capable for that particular uh, place for goddess. And they, even the girl doesn't know about the things, about that, the things that she has to deal with. And she has to be a god, goddess in, in many of the, um, I mean, traditions. Like for example, Newari caste is, in Kathmandu is like, among 365 days, they have a rituals for 364 days. And it's so long. And among for like Kumari, a lot of things uh, in where my is not um, was supposed to go out from the home. I mean, the, from the temple, especially where she is kept to. And so she was not a, like allowed to interact with other people except their family members. And she... Professor, what I found it a bit... In such a position that she... And people with this. Uh, yes, the lots of things has been changed. The girl can go and do whatever she uh, wants to. She can marry people she wants to. But like, oh, there are so many problems with this topic. And yeah, with the Kumari for 30 years and as still. Yeah, okay. Okay. It's hard to understand you, Pooja, but that's okay. We. We should move on to um, Frederick Douglass. And the reason I picked him was because his big passion is education. And then I, you know, I think, is that true of you? I mean, it, I think to some extent it is, right? Because in developing countries, education is like the ticket to a better life. It actually is in the US too. Um, so um, he, he was separated. Okay, so this is the thing about, again, cultural, the power of socialization, except does this mean moral relativism is true or is there a limit? And we do have a natural, there's basic natural things about human beings. And when societies 
try to condition people out of it. It's perverted and it makes people wicked because the socialization is a lie about life. So he talks about he's separated from his mother. Uh, slaves are separated from their mothers to hinder the development of their affection. And I mean, that's sick, right? <laughs> I mean, kids need their moms and moms naturally want to nurture their kids. And so to have a cultural uh, ritual or expectation that they separate them is really a wicked culture. Um, he thinks his father was, there was a rumor that the master was his father. Um, then there's the corruption of marriage. Slave owners have freedom to exploit the female slave's sexuality. When the children are born, okay, the mistress is jealous. The slave has to be whipped more than the others. So when the father, the master, uh, has sex with a slave, then um, the wife gets really jealous. And so the master either has to sell his own kid to someone else, or he can't favor his own kid or the mistress will suspect it, or he has to have his own, his other brother whip this kid, right? One of his sons whips the other. That is so perverted. Um, all right, and then children see acts of brutality. I didn't, you didn't read that section, but I mean, he saw his aunt being really completely abused, abused and brutalized. Um, and then white children can figure this out, right? Children know, you know, that they're a lot more alike than they are like adults. And so when adults give them a white kid absolute power over a black kid, they know that that's not right. But they're, you know, some of them will step right up into it and, and you know, just embrace it. And others will just really reject it. Um, and then I use the seven deadly sins that the institution creates these sins, right? Lust greed, pride, envy, wrath, anger, sloth, laziness, and gluttony. Okay, so later on, we'll go over Aristotle's virtues, but it's very similar to this, right? That all of the natural virtues are corrupted and everybody becomes wicked or out of balance, okay? So in terms of self-knowledge, for example, white people think they're a lot morally better, intellectually better, in any way better, inappropriately, right? They get overblown senses of themselves, whereas Black people get demoralized, dehumanized. They have less self-confidence, less belief in themselves and their natural abilities than is really the truth. So you can go through all those virtues and it slavery just drives everybody to an extreme and it's almost impossible to exercise virtue. If you do, you're going to be an outlier. You're not going to fit in. And that's a real problem. Um, so the section that I had you reading quite a bit of was when he learned to read, when Sophia had never had slaves before and she was actually nice to him at first. She smiled at him. She liked it when he looked at her in the eye. Just think about how, how absolutely perverted this institution is. And um, then her husband told her, she started teaching him to read and the husband said, no, no, you know, don't do that because then they'll never, they'll never accept slavery. Um, and he had this book, I think this is important. It was a dialogue between a slave owner and a slave and the slave gave better arguments and the slave owner let him free. 
Okay, why is this important? Well, the Greek view of the mind is that thought is an inner dialogue of the soul with itself. So at the end of the day, you're talking to yourself. I mean, you talk to other people about stuff, but then you go and you reflect on that. And, you know, you end up talking about your talking, right? Like in the class, right? When the class is over, you're going to reflect. So you're going to talk to yourself about the talk and about what you read and all that stuff. Um, and so, and Frederick Douglass said, well, that book got stuck in his head, right? He kept going over it in his head. And there was another one too. Um, I can't remember the name, but there, were, there was another document that he had read that promoted rights, um, African-American rights. And um, those just stuck in his head, right? And they were sort of his guiding light. So instead of his idea of God, as being, he did say that he thought it was providence. There were certain things like his spirit, his desire to be free. And then when he was picked to go to the Alds house, and then when he uh, won in, he beat out Mr. Covey in that two hour battle and Covey didn't come after him anymore. And there were these certain turning points in his life that he attributed to providence. Now, that's, that's also another thing where you can have this I idea that these things happened and they, they were life-changing things. And I don't know if there's some personal God, you know, who comes in there and intervenes, but I know that I will be grateful for the rest of my life that that happened, right? The trouble is when you start talking about a personal God, it's like, how come that God didn't help this person? And we have to explain all this other stuff, the unjust suffering and how come God, you know, there's so much you have to explain. But if you just say, all I know is I will always be grateful that this happened because it changed my life. And I don't know, you know, I'm not going to make claims about some personal God, but I am going to recognize that that was a spiritual awakening or that was a spiritual um, push forward that I just, I have to just be grateful for. Um, then he started his own Sabbath school. And again, it was religious people that came and tried to destroy it and punish them. And so time and time again, that's why Douglas has this very generic view of providence because most of the book is about religion made people worse. The people who sat in the front row at church were the ones who were the most cruel to their slaves. And his masters that were most religious were most cruel. And Mr. Freeland was the nicest one. And he didn't have anything to do with religion. So, um, yeah, I mean, Frederick Douglass's experience with organized religion was not positive. Um, I, I, get, I didn't give you this excerpt, but this was really interesting. So on holidays they would, the master would give them whiskey or alcohol to drink. And then they'd have, the standard thing was to have this big celebration. People get drunk, they start beating up on each other. And then the black people say, yeah, we are, we are low lives. We're not fully human. You can tell by our behavior. And then they're willing to be treated as slaves. So that's another way to maintain your oppression. And the fact that Frederick Douglass didn't do that stuff, and then they got mad at him, right? They, they made big trouble for him because he, instead of doing that, he went and taught other slaves to read. And that was the thing that white people punished them for. Um, to make a contented slave, it's necessary to make a thoughtless one. Now, in your case, it would be more like, I'm. well, I've, you've been talking about this, 
To make a contented wife, you have to make sure not to give her too much education, right? She'll be uppity. She won't put up with all this stuff. She might not accept all these roles, right? Um, so it's necessary to darken his moral and men mental vision um, to annihilate the power of reason. So uh, you can do this in terms of racism in your country, right? Is there racism in your country? Do the people in power um, oppress like the Rohingya Muslims in um, Myanmar, right? You take this group of people, you don't educate them, you, you know, put them in situations where there's no way they could develop a sophisticated way of resisting, right? And you just make them afraid and uneducated, and then you can manipulate them. Um, so you can think about that in your countries. Um, let's see. There's no right way. Okay, he has this whole list of, of masters that he had and he compares them to each other, but all of them are wrong, you know? And the guy that treated him the best was the, the people he was, that were his slaves were the ones that wanted to escape the most because he gave them a sense of their own dignity. And he talks about how Sophia was ruined after a while when she had slaves. That's a very sorry story. And I included that, um, that when he first met her was the first time she ever was in a situation of slavery. She'd grown up in a place without slaves. And so that's why she was nice to him at first. He's a seven year old kid, but after a while it just ruined her. Um, uh, economics, the humiliation of being treated as property. So, um, you know, some economic systems. Oh, yeah, my gosh, I was in the South. And there were Southerners defending slavery. And they said, well, there was zero unemployment, right? Everybody was employed. <laughs> they really mean this, right? They really, you know, oh, my God. Right, the economics, well, if you're growing cotton, you really need some cheap labor. So slave labor is really cheap. Um, that's just terrible, right? Um, but that would be an argument. People have, people will argue that kind of stuff. Um, and then religion made them worse. Okay, the arguments are bogus. And this is where I take, I go back to John Stuart Mill's um, outline. So why don't I do that? Because I, I take from his outline here, but let me go back to his outline and just do it straight shot. Um, and you can write notes while I'm doing this, right? Take your notes and then everybody gets to talk, right? So I'm taking the same outline as we did with sexism, right? The legal subordination of one race to the other is wrong, and it's a an hindrance to human improvement. It needs to be replaced. Why is it difficult to prove? Okay, because people do it, the preponderance of feeling, right? It's emotionally based. The conflict, what people feel is emotionally uh, attached to is wrong. The influence of social institutions, habits, and customs, the inability of people to re examine their habits and they're unwilling to do it. So, the burden of proof is on those who argue uh, for racial equality, except that it should be the other way around, right? Uh, that in general, in the modern world, people start with freedom and equality. And so, People who, who argue for inequality should be the ones that have to create the arguments, but they're not, right? Just because of habit and custom. It's difficult to prove a negative. It's difficult to prove everything we're doing is wrong. Um, but, right, it's not difficult for Sojourner Truth and Frederick Douglass when they're explaining what it's like. This is obviously wrong, but, the white people who were conditioned into it 
they don't think it's necessarily wrong. There was this romanticizing instinct, you know, African-Americans were meant to serve white people, right? <laughs> it's just the way the world works and isn't that handy. Um, it's natural, the inequality of the races is natural when you don't have any idea what's natural, you never gave them a chance. Uh, the inequality was sanctioned by the church, right? It was ordained by God, no empirical evidence and no knowledge, right? There was no knowledge, no research on African-Americans um, and they were denied education. So you give them IQ tests or something, yeah, they'll score lower, what else is no? Um, just a sec. Okay, so is this being recorded? Yes, yes, it's recording. Okay, thanks. Why is it important for someone to speak out? So this is, um, uh, again, you, the AUW students are the educated elite at this point. I, I know you don't think of yourself as elite, but if you go to college and you go to a good college, you are. So somebody has to speak out, that would be people like you. Um, Rachel, uh, racial domination was never initiated after the result of thought. And, you know, in the case of slavery, it, it was abolished in England long before it was abolished in the US. Um, and they just didn't want to find out about that, right? But from their point of view, it was just might makes right. Um, we have nothing against which to compare it. The origin was just might makes right. They had the power to do it, so they did it. Uh, it was started without any concern for social justice and someone needs to blow the whistle, right? What about this? Slaves accept it, right? That's what Sojourner Truth said, I used to accept it. And um, Frederick Douglass though, right from when he was seven years old, he didn't accept it because he had had that one experience, right? Um, anyway, but it's false, right? There were people working for equality. No oppressed class begins by asking for a complete change. They just want their oppressor to be less harsh. And I pointed that out before, right? They would compare masters. And that's why Sojourner Truth wanted to have babies for her master because he was so much nicer than the one she had before that. Okay, slaves are afraid to complain. Obviously, <laughs> they'll get beaten, right? Seriously beaten. Um, and they had nowhere to go. They had no out, no out. Uh, and so, all right, all the causes make it unlikely that they should be collectively rebellious, right? Why don't they rebel? Well, they're conditioned to accept it. They'll get beaten more. They don't have anywhere to go. You know, you just can't start running and run. <laughs> You'll get caught, right? You don't know where you're going. You don't have a compass. Uh, the owners want them to be willing. Uh, they want to be respected and waited on. Uh, all the institutions try to enslave their minds, right? Socialization. Uh, someone has to, um, someone has to do the work. And so this makes it, you know, you might as well say it's natural. But John Stuart Mill says, history teaches people have always held false beliefs that eventually get recognized. Someone has to be the messenger and tell the society what its prejudices are. This person is usually hated or disliked. So I want you to think about this because this is not moral relativism, right? This is the view that there is a natural foundation for justice and injustice. And there are always some people who can see it with their minds. They're not socialized and they, they have the responsibility to speak out even if they get in trouble for it. Um, because that's how progress is made, okay? The importance of free and open discussion. Um, 
experience cannot be evidence since you don't have experience of a society that's not racist. Every improvement, every other improvement comes with more equality. No one knows the nature of the races based on current experience because of the conditioning. Um, slaves' characters are too distorted. White people's characters are too distorted. Uh, we need a science of the influence of circumstances. And if you say, well, slaves have no interest, right? After Christmas and they've had their drunken brawl, they're perfectly happy to go back to slavery. <laughs> No, right? That's um, very few men know the characters of their own slaves, right? The slaves don't show them what they really think, uh, partly because they're socialized to be friendly, partly because they don't want to get in trouble. Um, when the slaves do respect their masters, um, they don't, the slaves still don't reveal their character. Um, very few people know themselves very well, but then if they're put in a situation of social, unnatural social constructions, it's even worse. Um, policies are inherently contradictory, right? If really they're by nature intended to be slaves, you don't have to force them to be slaves, right? If they're by nature stupid, try to get them to learn to read and they won't be able to learn, right? What's the problem, <laughs> right? Forcing them to be slaves, giving them the only option implies it's not natural. So Mr. Ald, you know, when he told Sophia, don't teach him to read, it's, you know, he's just revealing the truth, which is it is not natural. Um, so the truth is slaves have to do the work that white, whites need to be done. If they, if they choose, they wouldn't do it. So they have to be forced. So that isn't by nature, that's force. And then owners don't have to be responsible because the institution says they can own them anyway. There's no accountability. It's tyrannical power. Um, if you really want to impress them, don't allow them to read. Marriage, under slavery, it's completely corrupted. Families are split apart. Whites, um, and then whites claim that non-whites are incapable of forming close relationships, which is just crazy. Okay, family life is destroyed by slavery. It takes a long time to recover. Sojourner Truth just couldn't, her, her, you know, her kids, had already been really uh, crippled before she got custody of them. Laws would never improve if there weren't people whose sentiments were better than the existing laws. So some slave owners were like Mr. Freeland, decent, but still the institution's wrong. Um, to see the future of the species has been the privilege of the intellectual elite or those who've learned from them, to have the feelings of that future has been um, the distinction of a still rarer elite. Um, so the idea is that there are, there are people who can see ahead and be like prophets or visionaries. And the greatest benefit is that everybody can be free, right? Um, the gain in private happiness of liberating half the species, right? Free, uh, freedom of speech, freedom of association, freedom, um, opportunities for education, all that stuff is what really makes people happy. So then you think about what is a healthy psyche, right? Is it one that's free to think critically? And if so, how do you structure a society where the most pop possible people are given that opportunity, right? To think critically. All right, so here we go on our next round of comments. Um, let me start in the middle here. I'll start with Nuchat and go 
to the end and then, then go back to Ashlyn. So I'll try to give everybody, um, uh, you know, earlier or later time to present so that they don't just end up saying, oh, I agree with Ashlyn, <laughs> which is fine, you know, I don't mind, but I think maybe new chat, why don't you set the set the stage here and then we can go after go from there. Are you there? Okay. Now are you there? Okay, Masoma. Ah uh, yes, Professor, I'm here. Go ahead. Um, uh, professor, yeah, I really liked uh, the, that, uh, like he, you mentioned in the outline, like it's mentioned about the, you know, the social institution, how it was corrupted, and then how the virtue that Aristotle defined was corrupted with, by, by people. I mean, these are the same virtues that Aristotle talked about, but then like it is completely different how people in, uh, like, uh, you know, approach it in this time. And then, yeah, uh, also professor like, like uh, the way that uh, the, uh, there was a point, it was mentioned that, you know, slavery, uh, th there is an evidence that slavery described both the master and slave. So it reminds me the, uh, the Republic, I mean, the Politos idea when in the Republic, he, uh, like he discussed about the tyrannical institu institution. And then he said like, you know, uh, if a tyrannical person is like enslaving everyone, but then he himself is also a slave to his appetite part of the soul, right? Uh, he cannot uh, control over his desires and, and he is actually himself a slave. And then they, all the society is worse off because, you know, uh, everyone is disagree and then the, the, the slave is, you know, disagree and, and then they Master is also afraid that the, the worst thing that he did with the slaves, uh, he's afraid that the one day the slave will rebellion and then they will attack him. So no one is happy in this kind of society. And then, yeah, I'm agree that this is true that neither, uh, the, like the slavery destroyed both the master and the, the slave. Uh, I like this idea. Good, um, very good. Um, and then professor like uh, one more thing i mean like all of the idea it is mentioned about that about the slavery and then the history and all of this uh, was similar to mills right so is it like uh, he himself like i mean uh, douglas or it's frederick i don't know if i'm pronouncing it correctly is it like his argument or is it mills argument in here like it's very similar I, um I think they're very similar. There are certain things Frederick Douglass said that, that Mill also said, just because they're true. I mean, they didn't say it because the other person, they probably never read each other's books, right? But it's okay, just, yeah. it's just yeah. the, the most important things are these patterns that that's why when you can read Hinduism and the patterns in, Arjuna's life, or you can read Buddhism. I mean, these patterns just keep coming up and they don't, it's not because they read each other's stuff. It's because they lived, <laughs> right? Yeah. Life goes away. Okay. Yeah, Professor, because he, he's also mentioning that if uh, America, if Africans are slave by nature, then uh, you should not be afraid that they will be uh, rebels against us because they will by nature come back and then they will willingnessly want to be safe. right yeah so if that's your favorite argument you can write that down but that was also a favorite one with women too right yeah yeah give them all the opportunity they just won't take it um yeah okay good um fardine what have you got um okay professor so when i was reading the there there were a lot of interesting things but I don't know, one of the things that stayed with me uh, like very significantly was, uh, so he talked about uh, going to live, with, um, going to work for Sophia and uh, her husband. And when he describes that, so it, at first it begins like 
in a very positive way and he described these people as like it was the most positive experience he had up till then because of how kind Sophia seem, seemed and yeah as a reader like I almost like I start to feel relief for him because uh, he like he grew up in this horrible circumstances and now he he's learning to read and things are starting to look up and then um when her husband tells her not to teach him anymore because he gives a bunch of reasons and he said that he's a slave and that's all he'll ever be and by teaching him to read you are making him incompetent to be a slave and uh, he says all these things and just like as a reader i felt my heart breaking because uh he, he was hopeful and he was starting to feel um yeah he was just starting to he he must have felt like he was starting to turn over a new leaf and all these new doors were opening for him and then to have that like slam shut in his face um i mean he I, just as a reader i felt that and he must it must have been even harder on him uh but then he this really difficult demoralizing thing he turns it into something very powerful because when he hears mr all speaking uh about education like that he realizes that that must be the one thing he has to achieve to uh, change his fate and yeah I, that that was very powerful and i've sort of had a similar um motivation to pursue education myself because i just i've always i didn't have a defining moment like him but i just as i as i've grown up i've just had this sense of i i need to um get an education if i'm to be taken seriously <laughs> as a woman and yeah i just that's that's always been in my mind yeah, uh, that's yeah I, I i would think so i would think a lot of aw students thought of education as the ticket right where you know because they grow up seeing a lot of men treating women as inferior right and i would imagine aw students are smart and they you know they there's something that doesn't sit right with that and and the only way is to get a piece of paper you know get some degrees under your belt and um be respected uh yeah it's i hope so it and then the thing that really breaks my heart is the way that sophia then started becoming really mean right she completely changed her character and she wouldn't, she, she became paranoid that he might be reading the newspaper. Do you remember that? She sort of chased yeah. him around because she, you know, she hadn't fit in right. Now she has to try and fit in and she gets even, that, that's just awful. So and he yeah. also mentioned that, sorry, professor. And he also mentioned that part about she was even meaner than her husband instructed her to be. Just, she was just so desperate to be, you know, to, fit the mold, the societal that's mold. Right. Yeah. That's right, it's just awful. Um, okay, I'm gonna go backwards here. Okay, Aisha, are you there? Uh, yes, Professor, can you hear me? Yep. So I was uh, trying to connect it with my reflection, what I will be writing. So in this outline, it was mostly discussed about the racism. Um, okay, so in my society, I feel like there is a um, kind of classism rather than racism, and depending on the economic classes. And um, I mean, I cannot elaborate it right now, but um, I will obviously. So it was, um, there were some sort of characteristics of the racism which belongs to here in the classism in our modern societies. But I won't say it is a modern society. It's in between ancient and modern. That's what I already told in previous class as well. Um, so yeah, that's all I have now. Yeah, okay. I think class is a, a huge divider and um, women become divided according to class, which is sad, right? Rich women, lorded over poor women and that's bad and in my country um african americans now there are some of them that have gotten rich or privileged got a lot of degrees some of them just 
forget where they came from and forget how much they depended on other people to help them. And one of them is the Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. He just really thinks he did it on his own and he did not. And he's making all these terrible decisions. He's destroying uh, affirmative action. He's destroying uh, the voting rights bill. He votes with rich, powerful white people every single time. It's really sad. Um, so, so class, class is a is a big sad problem. <laughs> um, Christina, what you got? Okay, Falak, are you there? Yes, Professor. Um, I like how Douglas continued to learn his learning by exchanging bread from the uh, bread for lessons from the poor white boys. And then uh, whites used to say that slaves never complain, but it's not it's because of social conditioning that they never complain. At that time, um, there was a belief that education would spoil a uh, slave. And then uh, Sophia's husband told her that if she uh, educates this, uh, if she educates Douglas, then it would, education would spoil him. So, yeah. Okay. Aurora, do you have something? Yes, Professor. I just found something that uh, in that time, in Maryland, there is a common practice that newborns are separated from their mothers. And of course, this is article is all about slaves. And then in this article, it is uh, mentioned that the ancient and modern belief about the self. In ancient, the selves are natural thing and common, but in modern, usually we don't support the selves. Yeah, that's it. Okay, Ashlyn, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Professor. So I think the flip in Sophia's behavior is one of the critical elements that made um, Frederick to think about his enslavement. So just imagine if, if Sophia continued to treat him like that itself, uh, a very good manner, like an angelic face uh, he told, he won't be understanding or he won't be realizing that he, he is a slave or he's being treated as a slave. But that flip in Sophia's behavior made him understand that he's being treated as a slave. So I, I guess that that um, you know that switch in her behavior is one of the critical points in um, uh, Frederick's realization. And um, and other points were covered by all. And one one of the important points I thought is that um, I thought in my mind is that marriage, the authority of marriage in itself. You know, the slavery, even if we uh, believe that it's all ends by all means, but marriage, just take the authorities that we are having. Marriage in itself is an authority that, uh, you know, kind of enhances the idea of slavery indirectly. Like since we uh, South Asians are living in a patriarchal society, marriage is considered where women is, is uh, you know, is, uh, like where women should serve their husbands or children. So that in itself is not a responsibility of the women, but it's kind of a slavery. It is not necessary that women should serve their husband just because they are married to them. So slavery is happening in our modern world also. Again, one of the ideas that came to my mind, so exa uh, for example, in the economic sector or in the workforce, where people like the employees are being convinced by the authority to work in a very particular amount of pay or money, like uh, it would be more like they would be having more potential or there will be like their potential will be worth the money that they are getting like they're not getting like for example in a corporate or something there will be first this convincing or this kind of agreement that you should work in this amount of like twenty five thousand indian rupees for example so that itself is an authoritarian way or the agreement among the authority and the employee so i guess that's again a modern slavery happening uh, so yeah that's one of the points i wanted to bring right in. right yeah. it's definitely exploitation of human labor right mm. it's a kind of exploitation yeah and oppression um i think that's true 
Uh, very good. All right, so what's our next step? Um, I have lots of things. There's lots more here, but um, let me make sure that I get it kind of in, okay. All right, so the next thing I wanted to look at uh, was Aristotle's virtues, right? And I'll just sit here and brainstorm for a minute. Um, and then I'll give you five minutes, right? Another, well, I'll give you another 10 minute break. And you can write more about uh, um, Frederick Douglass, any aspect of it you want. And, and then you can also apply Aristotle's virtues here because Again, you might roll your eyes and say, why does she keep bringing this up? But the thing is, to me, when you look at this and you think of all the different dimensions of how that plays out in these stories, then you know, you know, that, yeah. So eating, just think of the, the fact that some slave owners starved their slaves and um, in Baltimore, when Fr uh, Douglas was in Baltimore, uh, the slave owners fed their slaves like it was a matter of respect. It was socially unacceptable to either starve your slaves or to treat them brutally, like beat them. So the social, the what was considered acceptable as a slave owner in Baltimore was very different from the South. Okay, that's that's important. Our country is still incredibly divided. And this, the slaveholding Southern states are just really, really in a different place. They're much more comfortable with authoritarianism of many different kinds. And they got way behind in terms of education. They're way at the bottom. Out of 50 states, the bright red Southern states that had slavery, they're like, out of eight of them, five of them will be on the bottom five, like 45th, 46th out of in education and healthcare and obesity. And it's just terrible. The legacy of slavery is just awful. And it's uh, a mindset of authoritarianism, privilege. But okay, so think about eating, how food was used as a tool right? To oppress or to gain obedience, or uh, it's a powerful tool, right? Because I mean, if a slave is exhausted and starving, it's very different than if they're fed. Then the drinking was used as a tool during the holidays, right? You give them alcohol, they get drunk, and they, they beat each other up, and then everybody's ready to go back. So it was used as a tool of oppression. And then sex was used, incredibly used, right? As a tool to oppress, where the white guy would have sex with his slaves and, and it would give him more property, right? The kids were his property. He could keep them or he could sell them. It's just awful. Um, then courage is another huge deal, right? Fear, the way that the slave owners ruled by fear and the amount of courage it took for anybody to step outside of the norm and the courage it took for, uh, Frederick Douglass was saying he admired those people who came to his Sabbath school because they knew they were gonna get beaten if they got caught. And so they just wanted to learn and they had incredible courage. But, uh, and Sojourner Truth really had incredible courage to speak out, right? about God and her view of God. I mean, she had moral courage. Um, she had, I mean, she just really went outside the, the norm, right? It took a lot of courage for her to do a lot of the stuff that she did. Um, but what happens is, of course, that the system itself rewards complete self-indulgence of the white folk, right? And complete inability 
to exercise self-control, sexual self-control by choice, right? So at, the slaves could not get married and be faithful to a spouse. That would be the norm, not even close. And the white folk didn't have to do that, right? They could have sex with any slave they want. So they're way at extremes, right? The mean of monogamy and the mean of raising your kids, right? Until they are raising them and giving them a strong character. That's standard stuff in virtue theory. Children are raised to like virtue for its own sake. It's not an option, right? The, on both sides, they learn unjust privilege on the one side and unjust servility on the other side. So it's very extreme and it's extremely corrupting influence. Um, courage, again, the one side uh, has to exhibit, I mean, fear is um, used as a tool and it takes incredible courage to stand up. And the other side can be cowards, right? They can hide behind tradition that, you know, the white guys have no moral courage to stand up. And the black people have always, you know, they, they're just, the, the penalty for having moral courage is so great that you can't criticize them for not having it, right? Um, so generosity, um, there's no, um, that is not a virtue because it's not middle class. There's no middle class where people have what they need and then they can be generous, right? The slave owners have way more that is just. And, you know, and the idea that you're breeding uh, Black people for your money, that you, you buy a woman as a breeder. You remember that, Mr. Covey? And then he hired this hired man who was married, but he wanted them to have sex so that he could get more property. Oh my God, you know. Um, and then uh, magnanimity, the rich giving away money. There's no, that isn't, that is not a, a virtue. The society has nothing to do with that. Uh, anger, right? The slave owner has a right to be angry. You can do any, anything you do can make them angry. If you remember, uh, I think both of them talked about that. If you did anything wrong, they could just, go off and whip you and beat you for anything. On the other hand, the slaves had to be servile and docile. They could never get angry, right? Huge, extreme, rational ambition. The white people have way more privilege than they deserve. And black people have no chance to develop their abilities, to know what abilities they have, to develop them and to become citizens, right? Nothing. Whereas the, the owners just inherit their privilege. They don't have to earn it. They don't have to be good slave owners. They don't have any accountability. Um, pride, what gets honored, right? So in the really corrupt cases, people are honored for being brutal toward their slaves. And then in Baltimore, they're honored for they're dishonored for being brutal. So honor works differently, but still um, it's, you know, Frederick Douglass should have been honored and, and Sojourner Truth, they're honorable, right? But they didn't, they were um, labeled dishonorable. So the way honor is distributed is totally corrupt. Uh, sense of humor, no, you know, it's, there's nothing in the mean, right? Um, and rational friendships, slaves are not allowed to have friendships because then they would come together. Uh, Frederick Douglass had friendships, the people he was teaching to read, but that was all had to be under the surface. It was considered a vice and threatening. Um, so the way people bond together, the slave owners bond together, it's based on a corrupt notion of a common goal the slaves bond together. They can't, you know, they're not allowed to, 
when they do, it's often just for survival rather than any kind of flourishing. And then sociability, of course, the slaves put up with all these injustices because it would just be worse. And so that's, that's all corrupted. Truthfulness is totally corrupted. Uh, the economic system is totally corrupted. The laws that justify this are totally corrupt. How the wealth gets distributed is completely corrupt. Um, that the punishment of wrongdoing, what's defined as wrong and how it gets punished is totally corrupt. Um, how to apply the laws to particular cases is totally corrupt. Um, and so, you know, any sort of particular decision that's made is within this context of complete corruption. Um, intellectual capacities, African Americans have no opportunity for any kind of production of their own, right? Creating things of their own. Um, uh, and then of developing themselves intellectually, they, they're not even supposed to learn to read. Whereas the white people, um, you know, they could develop or not, but they're this owning slaves is something that they, it's a privilege they have without any intellectual virtue, moral virtue, practical virtue, nothing. It's just written in the laws, no accountability. Um, all right, so I'm gonna give you then, it's 28 minutes after, I'm gonna give you 10 minute break, um, 12 minute break, and then, you can start writing, you can get ahead on your posts. And then um, I think, you know, I'll just keep you another 10 minutes or so and we'll move on. But I'll just sort of wrap it up. Um, okay, go ahead. I'll, um, let me see, I'll pause for. So for Douglas, religion was what his, what he witnessed was that it's a tool to make people even more brutal because it justifies it. And also it's a way to deceive yourself about your character because you can convince yourself you're actually a pious religious person and you're not. So he did have an idea of providence, um, but he really didn't, that wasn't what really drove him. It was his idea of education and getting out by learning to read. Anyway, so that's the main thing. And then again, don't spend too much time. So um, what I would like to do is spend a little bit more time. I want to go through the outline on homosexuality. And then um, before that, I'll just say, if any of you want, look, the point is you are getting to know yourself and your own mind. All I'm doing is reminding you of what we've covered so far. If you want to include anything about um, Augustine, eternal law, if that, if that punched a button in your head and you want that in your post, do it. If you want to go back to the uh, Thomas Aquinas, if you want to go back to the Pope's uh, speeches against religious bigotry, and it, you know, if you want to just scroll on that one paper that was an outline of the points that he made, and see if, if that seems relevant to this class. And then Martin Luther King's movement, right? So both Frederick Douglass and Sojourner Truth became activists at, after, you know, their early years. So if you wanted to um, show the relationship between a spiritual odyssey, right, getting through all these obstacles, you know, internalized and external and then becoming an activist and helping the next generation. If you want to do anything like that, that's great. Um, utility, the greatest happiness for the greatest number. Um, it, you know, did the, did the slave owners think, right? This provides the greatest happiness for the greatest number. 
Uh, obviously, John Stuart Mill did not think that, right? Because his whole outline is against women, and he was definitely against slavery also. Um, but how is it that the people themselves think? You know, how could they think? Do they really think this maximizes happiness? Anyway, so that's what I, I you know, a student might want to say, is it all right if I read about Augustine? Well, of course it is, you know. I just want you to know that you're getting to know your own mind. So, um, okay, so let's do the homosexual thing. And you can think about this in your own mind because the students I have at, um, <clears throat> at Lyon, every year it's the same. Like you go through the part on women, fine, they totally agree. And then they think, well, that's, those are good arguments. You know, I wouldn't have thought of that. And um, then the thing on race and they're okay with that. Although since Trump, you know, they're aware that this is not just given, you know, but they, they usually are against racism or they'll say they are, you know, but they'll vote for Trump. Uh, not because I'm racist. Yeah. Okay. Whatever. Anyway. Um, but when it comes to homosexuals, it's so funny because, oh no. Right. And it's, I say, it's the same arguments. <laughs> and the thing is, I just back off and I say, well, this would be the standard liberal argument. This is the standard argument given by liberals who want homosexuals, non-binary people to have equal rights. So this is the argument for equal rights, just like it was for women, just like it was for race, right? So they, the, okay. <laughs> The principle which regulates this and um, discriminates against people with a different orientation is wrong. And it's a hindrance to human improvement and it needs to be replaced by a principle of equality, okay? Admitting no power or privilege on one side or disability. Okay, why is it difficult to prove? Is this true when people, you know, so you guys start writing, <laughs> writing your notes, is, is it mostly people just believe it based on emotion and there's a conflict between their emotions and what's reasonable, you know, what science has figured out? The influence of social institutions, habits and customs and prejudices, the inability or unwillingness of people to re-examine their habits and their socialization. Um, again, the burden of proof. <coughs> shouldn't be on the people for argue for equality. The burden of proof should be on the people that argue for inequality, right? Um, but again, the people who are arguing for equality have to bear the burden of proof. Um, it's difficult to prove a negative. It's difficult to prove that everything we're doing is wrong. So, I mean, 50 years ago, right, I, I'm old. So when I was your age or in high school, nobody ever talked about non-binary, right? It just was not in the social eye, in the public eye at all. Um, so I do have to tell you a funny story. There was a gay guy in our church. My dad is a preacher and um, he was a, an artist. He was a weaver and we went to his house for dinner and he had a really fancy house, you know, <laughs> just the stereotype about gay guys, right? They're, they're super artistic and they have, everything's perfect and they have all of this. And he had this bathroom that had, it was black and then like aluminum, you know, like silver that sort of reflected back. <laughs> and he'd have these squares. I mean, it was, it was one of those things, but um, so he hadn't come out, but then I think after I left home for college, he came out to my dad. He went to my dad and said, okay, I'm gay. Um, 
and you can kick me off the committees because he's a very prominent member. You know, he was on the organ committee and I think he was on para, pastor parish relations, whatever. He said, you can kick me off the committees, but I hope you don't kick me out of the church because these are my friends. And um, my dad said, okay, Merle, when I was a, a sailor, he was a sailor in World War II on a merchant marine ship. He said, when we would dock, you know, when we'd go on land for a few days, um, the only, I noticed that there were these gay bars, right? That people went to. And um, he said, you know what, Merle? I think gay people should be able to feel just as comfortable in church as they feel in a bar. So forget it. <laughs> and the idea there is that if the only place gay people can go where they feel comfortable is a bar, they'll go to a bar. And then everybody will say, oh, all they do is drink all day. And they're, you know. And if you don't give them a chance to get married, oh, they're just promiscuous. Oh, wait a second. <laughs> Yeah, they have sexual relationships, not in the context of marriage, because they don't even get to get married, you know? So, uh, so anyway, how do you, there was all this fear, if you give them equality, <coughs> then what, you know, people are so afraid. So for a while, it was, well, you know, marriage the marriage institution will fall apart. And it's just like, why? If you give more people a chance to get married, you know, there'll be more people making these long-term commitments, which is what you need. But somehow people thought if a gay couple moved next door, then that meant that the guy could go have sex with somebody else because the sex wasn't tied to procreation or something. I think it was just an excuse, right? So romanticism, right? The idealizing of traditional families and that it's natural. Well, it's proven that for some people, same-sex orientation is their experience, okay? Um, some people have red hair, you know? It's, it's not a moral, um, it's not a sign of moral degeneracy, right? Um, gay people are not, promiscuous, they're not um, pedophiles, right? They're, they're just, they have that orientation. Um, and religion, of course, condemns it. And so it's the same arguments. I hope everybody understands this, right? That this is the same with sexism, the same with racism, you know, God ordained, blah, blah, blah women have their place and it's just so wonderful, blah, blah, blah. Okay, and basically we don't know, right? And now we're getting more information about this. Why is it important to speak out? Because this uh, heterosexual uh, discrimination domination was never initiated after the result of thought. There was never any experiment tried on what a society with equal rights for non-binary what would be like, right? Mm -hmm. So it was always just might makes right, right? The origin was just like everything else, might makes right. Heterosexual had the power to dominate, so they did, and then they gave pseudo reasons. Um, it was started and perpetuated without any concern for justice or social expediency, someone needs to blow the whistle, then, <coughs> okay, but they, but hetero, but homosexuals and, you know, non-binary people, they accept it, sorry, I, they accept sexual domination, sorry, I, I didn't, <coughs> I should have taken the word race out and put sex, I tried to write in lots of these cases, but, well, first of all, they are now working to, to break this down, they, and, and when I was in high school, yeah, they didn't want to speak out because they were afraid, social ostracism, they wouldn't get hired for a job, they wouldn't get accepted into college. I mean, yeah, discrimination is discrimination. 
And people who are discriminated against really have a lot of reasons to put up and shut up. Um, okay. Then they, uh, they began by just asking not to get beaten up, you know, because they'd be killed once in a while. And that was the first thing was that that is murder. You know, that people should be accused of murder. Um, and then they're afraid to complain, right? There'll be housing discrimination. I know people who said, well, I would never rent my apartment to them. Well, what is them? Yeah, I know people who are homophobic. Um, all the causes make it unlikely that they should rebel. Um, heterosexuals, they don't want to use overt force, overt force, that makes them look bad. So they socialize citizens into being threatened. Um, and they socialize homosexuals into thinking their lives will be better if they just accept it. Um, the institutions try to enslave them. Right, they actually commit suicide more often. I mean, they're very self-loathing, obviously, or they have been. So it's getting better, but um, they never get to develop their characters in any sort of natural way. But history teaches that people have held false beliefs. Someone has to be the messenger. Uh, ancient societies, modern societies, people are assumed to be free and equal individuals, right? Given the opportunity to develop their abilities. Uh, modern economics, right? This is one reason they're given rights is they're very good employees. <laughs> um, they should be able to do what they do best. It's unjust to hinder them. The importance of free and open discussion uh, an enlightened estimate of what would be most advantageous. Uh, can't be based on evidence. We don't have enough experience. Um, every improvement has been accompanied by greater equality. Nobody knows the nature of the sexual orientation because it's been perverted, right? Um, so when gays were more oppressed, they were more. Uh, they had more sexual partners because there was no reason uh, not to. Plus, I mean, if they had stayed with the same partner, then people would find out they're gay, right? <laughs> they would get tend to get um, more mistreatment if they had stuck with the same person. They get punished for a long-term commitment. Oh, anyway, their characters are distorted. We're ignorant. Uh, we need a science of laws about the influence of circumstances. Um, and then, you know, originally they have no interest in politics, right? <laughs> well, obviously, because they would get so punished for it. They couldn't get a job. They couldn't buy a house. I mean, who wouldn't? Who? I mean, yeah, it's just crazy when people say, well, they don't speak out. Oh, really? Um, they don't know. Very few heterosexuals know the characters of non-heterosexuals. They don't know. They don't even know who is, right? And they don't know the effect of social conditioning. They don't recognize that their views are just a description of their own experience, which is often based on rumors. Um, uh, when heterosexuals teach, uh, treat them equally, they still don't expose themselves out of fear. Very people, few people know themselves very well, but when there's a socially constructed, a false social construction, it makes it even worse. It's impossible for the power to gain any knowledge of the powerless because um, they're servile, right? They don't say anything. Um, Let's see, um, policies are inherently contradictory. If people are uh, heterosexual by nature, this was my question always, right? Is that why would anybody choose homosexuality? I mean, why would 
as a choice. The, the argument was, well, it's a choice. Well, why would anybody choose it? Because all they do is get beaten up, hated, discriminated against, can't get up. Why would anybody choose that? Like that is a completely absurd argument. Um, they try, right? But they, you know, they end up saying, I can't, right? This is who I am. Um, why would they choose to be discriminated against and demonized? Forcing them to be heterosexual by making it the only way they can survive implies that it's not natural for them, right? Same thing, right, as women and, and race. Perhaps the truth is the status quo assumes heterosexuality is the only reality. Therefore, if given any other choice, non-heterosexuals would not pretend to be heterosexual, right? So they have to be forced into it. By forcing them, the powerful don't have to be responsible, right? Uh, by giving citizens other options, they have to treat non-heterosexuals responsibly. If you want to oppress non-heterosexuals, make it illegal for them to get an education, blah, blah. Okay. Um, in a modern society, the foundation for the laws must be secular. So marriage as a legal institution should separate church and state, right? So the, the government should have civil unions, right? A secular based uh, relationship that also has legal protections and legal advantages. Um, there's no reason to think that non-heterosexuals are emotionally incapable of long-term committed healthy sexual relations. There's no evidence of a higher level of abuse in non-heterosexual relationships. Heterosexual marriage has been a relationship in which one male has complete power, right? It's the heterosexual relationships that are really perverted. That, right, that's now considered unjust. Women, married women are starting to get more rights. Um, in the US, it wasn't until 1994 that a woman could take her husband to court for rape. So basically he had complete power over her until the 1990s. Um, even then there's 38 states that if a woman tries to do that, the guy gets amnesty. He's not gonna get accused, which basically says he has complete power in 38 states still. And, you know, to say that heterosexual marriage is God's plan and gives men absolute power, and then to say homosexual marriage is evil, even when the people relate to each other much more equally, is just, <laughs> right, it's, it's intellectually dishonest. It's emotionally dishonest. Um, uh, when people are given power, they often abuse it. Um, so in general, non-heterosexual relationships have less probability of being abusive because it's the male-female that's the absolute power relationship. So it's more likely that non-heterosexual relationships would be more egalitarian. Um, Okay, when they're not allowed to marry, they might become more promiscuous because there's no incentive to make lifelong commitments, no public ceremony, no accountability. Um, people who are happily married don't want to force others to behave that way. People who haven't thought about it tend to want to fall back to the status quo, right? And just they don't want change. If they were actually treated as equals, non-heterosexual would be less self-abnegating and, he and heterosexual would be less egotistical and self-righteous. So this is a self-knowledge thing, right? It makes heterosexuals feel like they're more virtuous than they are just because they were born with an orientation. Whereas 
non-heterosexuals feel less virtuous than they are, even though it's not a matter of virtue. It's just an orientation. Um, let's see, equality before the law is, is necessary before life at home will, will lead to moral cultivation, even with the heterosexual marriage, right? And so um, anyway, so why not, why isn't it the same for a non-heterosexual marriage? Um, okay, laws will never be improved if it weren't for a number of people whose sentiments are better than the laws. Um, but, so there are a lot of uh, heterosexuals don't really understand what homosexuals are up against, but they need to, and they need to support them. Um, people use religion to teach non-heterosexuals they should sacrifice themselves and accept abstinence and, you know, because God says so, <laughs> all that stuff. So this is a case where, it, again, that wasn't my father and it wasn't his interpretation of what, how, how Christians, how Methodists should treat uh, non-heterosexuals. It wasn't the way it went on in my church. But, you know, in the churches where they do discriminate, there still has been this history in modern where you separate secular from religious and seeing the future of the species has always been the privilege of the elite. And it's up to the elite now to promote equality. Um, so I, I don't know where those of you, who, you know, where you stand on this, but wherever you stand on it, I think, you know, going through all these arguments in your head, in your mind, and then realizing they're all the same arguments as there have been for women and, um, and race, right? People really believed, you know, women's natural place is in the home and it's all natural. And then the same with African Americans, it's all natural, it's in the Bible. And so, you know, that would be the first argument people think it's not natural. It's like, wait, science shows us that some people are oriented that way. Okay, so what are you going to do about it? Um, so I did have one last thing, and then I'll let you go. And I'm sorry we've taken the whole time. Again, please don't go back and listen to three hours, just half an hour, whatever you need. You might, I, prefer you didn't listen to any of this. Just finish your post in half an hour and that's it. But um, so I don't know if you've ever heard of the movie Boy Erased. And I don't know if you um, can get the movie. Um, I'll write it in the chat here. Um, boy Erased. And so it's about a boy who went his parents took him to a gay conversion camp. Have you ever heard of these camps where they try to change gay people and make them straight? Um, yeah. <laughs> anyway, it's his experience. And this guy is a dictator. And OK, so if you want to watch it, it's interesting. His parents really thought his dad was a Baptist preacher, and they really thought he was going to go to hell. Right. And so they paid money for him to go. And the movie is partly about his mother who accepted all this until she realized her son was having a mental breakdown. And so she picked him up and took him home. And then she started questioning. Right. Yeah, John Atul. OK. Um, and so it is, you know, it's a good story about accepting things and then becoming a critical thinker and all that. But the thing I want you to know is he was my student. I had him for five classes. He can, you know, I was very close to him. Um, he studied with me. He studied Greek tragedy and Plato. And uh, I had him for lots of classes. I knew him really well. I recommended him for the Peace Corps after college. He went to the Ukraine and he flew back and he flew back to visit me before he went home to see his parents. Um, 
And it's funny because his mother's name is Martha. So <laughs> that was funny too. But um, anyway, he was my student and he wrote a book. And I, you know, if you wanted to read the book, I'm in the acknowledgments, um, but I'm not in the movie because that part of it, I actually met him after the movie's over. And what's really interesting is that the guy running this camp told his parents at the end of the summer or at the end of a couple of weeks that he's not ready yet. He needs to spend, to live in a dorm there. He was actually living with his mom in a hotel and then she'd drive him over to the place in the daytime. But, um, but the guy told him, well, he needs to stay in the dorm for a year and then he can get, you know, reformed um and they turned him down and it's right after that that he he went back to college and I met him so I never would have met him if his parents had gone along with that so that's kind of interesting but anyway if you ever have the time or inclination or whatever to see that movie um I saw it with my daughter in Washington DC because they never showed it in my town because my town is really anti-gay. Um, I don't even think they showed it. I don't know. I went online to see the closest theater because I wanted to go. And the closest theater was 230 miles away. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, I waited till I visit my daughter and I went with my daughter in Washington, D.C. And I really started crying because he was actually in little bits of it and I started bawling and <laughs> my daughter these other people are looking around and my daughter goes she was his teacher <laughs> and these people in Washington DC are going oh really like I'm some kind of a strange creature you know you live there <laughs> like you have uh, it was really really pretty funny um but yeah, America is a lot of different countries. Um, people are really different in different parts of the United States. And um, I'm glad I'm back in Minnesota. <laughs> this is a very gay friendly place where I am right now. It has been for decades. So I'm glad I'm here. Um, anyway, so I'll let you go. The next time we are doing, actually we're reading a couple of women from them from Muslim women, one from a country, maybe Somalia, a country in Africa, and then one from, I can't remember, but the book called Nomad and a book called Dancing in the Mosque. And then they are about women using education to pull themselves up. So anyway, that's where we're going for next time. And again, I hope I start having office hours the day after tomorrow. And then again, I hope everybody gets caught up. It's my goal. I Don't you wish everybody could be together? I mean, don't you think it would be fun, right? I, yeah, all right, whatever. I can't see people, it's sad. But go ahead, you can go. Bye-bye. Um, right, Professor, thank you.